From the 1968 Olympics, when two black athletes, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, raised their fists in the black power salute during the national anthem, to Muhammad Ali risking his career in boxing by refusing to be drafted to fight in the Vietnam War, through Billie Jean King leading the fight for equal treatment of women. Political statements, they've long been a part of U.S. sports. More recently, we've seen athletes protesting police brutality, like Naomi Osaka wearing face masks bearing the names of people killed by the police in the United States. And in 2016, a seminal moment. Colin Kaepernick, a player in the National Football League, or NFL, began kneeling during the national anthem to protest racial injustice. Then, last week, just after we recorded the conversation that you're about to watch, another moment of reckoning. Fired Miami Dolphins coach Brian Flores is suing the NFL and three teams, alleging systemic and structural racism in their hiring practices. Flores' suit comes just as the NFL is working to rehabilitate its image and curb calls for boycotts over its treatment of Kaepernick. With the Super Bowl, the annual championship game of the NFL, coming up right around the corner, we take a look at the state of politics and sports today and examine just how far we've come. Joining me to discuss sports and activism, we have Michael Bennett Jr., former NFL player with the Seattle Seahawks, pro bowler, activist, and author of Things That Make White People Uncomfortable, a book that he co-wrote with Dave Zirin, sports editor of The Nation magazine, and author of 11 books on the politics of sports, including his latest, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. Good to see you both. Uh, Michael, I'm going to start with you. Back in 2017, uh, you decided not to stand for the national anthem until you saw equality and freedom. Why did you make that decision, and what kind of response did you get? It was a hard decision. I think internally with team, I think there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of battles within the organization just because a lot of people feel like, you know, politics and sports don't mix, but I think there's a sense of uh, where we have to connect our humanity to what's happening around us. And although you freedom isn't always expected in a lot of things, but being able to use our platform just to bring awareness to people who are experiencing a different life than we're experiencing and trying to build a sense of empathy. So there was a lot of backlash from like, just, you know, a sense of white America who doesn't understand a black man who's, uh, it seems to have, you know, material, but they only equate our humanity to material. And it's like, it's not about the money. It's about when you don't have the money and you just recognize as you're black, being black, what can happen to you if you engage with the police or you engage in the wrong area and how your life can be shortened just because it's simpleness of just the color of your skin. Michael, do you think that there was an expectation that because you had a different class position, because you were a well-paid athlete, that you wouldn't care about what was happening to everyday black people on the ground? No, you know, it's interesting because, you know, in one of Muhammad Ali's books, um, he was talking about the time he won an Olympic medal and he tried to eat in a, a restaurant. Although he had run an Olympic medal and all these different things have happened, he still couldn't get in the restaurant and how he threw that, you know, medal into, into the river. And it's like, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what kind of accolades or what kind of wealth you accommodate in America. At the end of the day, race has a lot to do with what's happening to people all around this country. Dave, Michael is speaking to these powerful relationships between sports and politics. There are a lot of people who argue and who genuinely believe that sports are supposed to be the respite from politics. The sports is where you go for entertainment. It's not where you go to find an arena for political change. You obviously have made a career saying just the opposite. Uh, why? Well, honestly, because when I hear people say sports and politics shouldn't mix, I feel like what they really mean is that sports and a certain kind of politics shouldn't mix. You know, the politics of a Michael Bennett, the politics of people who stand for social justice and human rights, that's what they don't want to see in sports. But when it comes to nationalism, when it comes to militarism, when it comes to commercialism, when it comes to all those kinds of political issues, that's politics. And so just because we say we don't want to see politics or we don't think politics should be in sports, I mean, honestly, that's sort of like saying you don't believe in gravity when you're falling out of an airplane. Michael, how do we get here? You know, there was a moment when Muhammad Ali is refusing to fight in the Vietnam War. There's a moment uh, in the 90s, though, where athletes are suddenly uh, less willing to share their opinions. Uh, they don't want to take political statements. I think about 
uh, when Michael Jordan famously said uh, Republicans buy sneakers, too, as a response to why he wouldn't endorse a particular political candidate. How do we get from the Ali moment to that moment in the 90s where athletes are doing less uh, and speaking less about these issues? Uh, I think there's a sense of, like, I don't know, I feel like it's not just an athlete thing. I think revolution has always been by the common man, and I think there's a historical evidence of that. And also, I think sometimes as athletes, um, the the title of athlete allows us not to be connected to the idea of what the entirety of what humanity is experiencing. And we kind of put ourselves in a bubble. And I think Ali burst that bubble. And then as we start to get more in tune with capitalism, that bubble started to, you know, fill back up and cover us and consume us again. You know, we got, there was so much with money that was happening and so much, the, the contracts got bigger, the television got bigger, the commercials got bigger. It just became this disconnect with what's happening on a daily basis to all kinds of communities. Michael, how, how conscious is that capitalist piece in the minds of athletes in your experience? In other words, like, do athletes just get caught up in the moment and they don't realize it? Or have you experienced athletes who are like, nah, bruh, I am not doing that protest. I am not making that statement because there's too much money on the line. Yeah, I think it's I think it is money. There's a lot of athletes who are like, man, I'm doing this for the money, which I can't understand at some moment. People are doing it for the moment and they really want to support their families. But also there's moments where the athletes that I don't understand are the ones who are significantly compensated or that are also worldly renowned and don't take the opportunity to share the message, which which makes Kaepernick very interesting. And also somebody like um uh, LeBron James, who constantly is on the forefront of all of that, regardless of the money that he's made, he's also is saying things. And I think there's a lot of athletes that I've ran into that like, I'm not saying anything. I don't want anything to happen to me. And, you know, there's people who, you know, one of my athlete friends, he said he supported uh, some of us and then his family got threats back in Texas. So I think there is a sense of where a lot of people are affected by their communities and their families are still living in these certain areas. So mm. sometimes it's about money, but also sometimes it's about the safety of their families. Interestingly enough, like even like Justin Britt was telling the story about how he supported us. And then back the next year, he tried to have a football camp and nobody wanted to come and serve him at a restaurant or did they not want to support his football camp anymore? Wow. Those are, I mean, those are high stakes. And, and you mentioned Colin Kaepernick. Dave, you wrote a book called The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. Uh, Kaepernick isn't the only person who's ever taken a stand. He's not even the only person of his generation or in the NFL who took a stand. But his stand did have a specific impact on the league and indeed on the country and the national discourse around sports and politics. What was the effect of Kaepernick? Uh, you say he changed the world. How? Yeah. Um, before, I, I just want to say a quick addition in case uh, listeners don't know who the Justin Britt is, who Michael Bennett was just referring to. That, that was a white teammate of Michael's uh, who was in solidarity with Michael. So that's a white former player not being served in a restaurant and not having people at his camp. Imagine what it's been like for black athletes. Uh, over the last 10 years as we've seen this return of the politicized athlete. And it really has been like a 10-year period. Uh, women athletes, male athletes, LGBTQ athletes, there's been an explosion of politics over the last decade. And Kaepernick is only just a part of that story. You know, but he came up taking that knee in 2016. And we're talking about, right now, a period that I think goes back to the murder of Trayvon Martin and the Miami Heat led by LeBron. Uh, speaking out against that. So Kaepernick is just a part of this story, but I think he represented an incredible acceleration and elevation of the politics in the new athletic movement. And that's how he changed the world. He changed the world because he took this feeling of protest that was out there and he brought it to the point of, I think, the greatest contradiction of every sporting event, and that's the playing of the national anthem. And by taking that knee, he was issuing a direct challenge to this country saying that there is a gap between what this country says it represents and the lived experiences of black and brown communities, particularly around the issue of police violence. And by doing that, what he did was he forced white fans to confront the bigotry, racism, and violence that exists in U.S. society, forced them to confront it against their will. Hmm. And I think that's something that the entire Black Lives Matter movement has done. And it's generated both solidarity in white communities. We saw that in the protests in 2020. It's also generated a horrific and violent backlash seen in everything from book burning to the Patriot Front, which is some clown right-wing 
uh, group that just marched in D.C. by the Lincoln Memorial. I mean, the confidence of the hard right in this country is one of the effects of polarization. And Colin Kaepernick is a part of representing that polarization. Now, some people have said to me, oh, Colin Kaepernick, uh, you're celebrating someone who polarized this country. And my response to that is just to say, Colin Kaepernick didn't polarize this country. You know, police brutality polarized this country. Racism polarized this country. Inequality has polarized this country. What Colin Kaepernick did was just point out for everybody to see that the emperor right now is not wearing clothes. Mm. When the response comes to Colin Kaepernick, Michael, and the league start to make some changes, there are some people who argue that the league's changes weren't real, that they were superficial, that they were performative. That, you know, the NFL letting people uh, have slogans on their helmets, uh, you know, like Stop Hate or, or Black Lives Matter. You know, when you see stuff like that, uh, is there any real substantive change there? Or is that just the league sort of playing into a narrative for its own benefit? And, and, if, it's, it, and if it is the latter, what does real change look like? I think the NFL tries to make positive strides with the leadership, but I think there's just such a disconnect between... Um, I don't think the NFL could really ever have the impact that it could have because Colin Kaepernick never been into the back into the NFL. I think the number one thing that could have really helped the NFL really make his impact was invite Colin Kaepernick to have a seat at the table and to help control the narrative and bring in the the ideas and the people that he's met around activists and people who have truly are ears to the streets and have their feet to the ground and and, and really understand what's happening in these communities how. That, that could have been a, a great change. And I think the greatest thing I think that to me that could be changed on top of police brutality is, you know, investment in things such as education, um, um, uh, hospital hospitals and access to fair nutrition, um, libraries, parks, just like the everyday necessities that human beings need, not just the victimization of it, but also the opportunity to actually have a, a real foot at the start of the line and really have an opportunity to really run that race that America says that everybody has the opportunity to be, you know, has the dream to be what they want to be. I think that's an opportunity to really allow people like us to go into our communities and really change them the way that we see fit. Dave, one of the ways that the NFL attempted to change those communities and to bring people in, because Michael makes an important point, Colin Kaepernick made the sacrifice. The league made every shift except finding a way to get Colin Kaepernick back in the mix. Uh, to have a seat at the table and to help, as he said, shift the narrative. Um, one person they did bring in to help shift the narrative was Jay-Z and his company, Rock. Hey, to the OG. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, see, and see, that response is what the NFL... See, you throwing up the Rock, that's exactly what people said the NFL I know, wants man. to happen, right? Is that, you know, if you bring Jay-Z in, he's popular, he's beloved by the community, the streets love him, and if you bring him in to not just do the halftime show at the Super Bowl, but to in do the community engagement piece, that it will make black people stop complaining, that it'll make protesters say, look, the NFL does care about what's happening in black communities, and Jay-Z can now run interference, pardon the metaphor, but Jay-Z can now run interference for, for the league as opposed to doing the substantive work. When you see the NFL make moves like that, does it make you uh, more skeptical? Does it make you wary of the move, or does it make you say, maybe, maybe there's some positive opportunity here? I mean, it makes me realize that they're operating with a carrot and a stick at the same time. Uh, the carrot is, look, we're bringing in Jay-Z. Look, we're putting slogans on the helmets. Look, we've got a special committee that's going to work on these issues, all carefully controlled by the league. Look at the halftime show this year. We're bringing out Dre and Snoop and Eminem. That's going to be the halftime show this year. Look at all these things. And that's on one side, but we can't forget the stick part. Like, look, Colin Kaepernick, still unemployed. Look at the executive class of the league, the ownership class of the league. We're talking about counting on one hand uh, the people of color who truly have a seat at the power tables in the National Football League. And, you know, a leading NFL writer named Michael Silver, he even works for the NFL Network. Uh, after some of the recent round of firings of black coaches, Michael Silver said, look, there is institutionalized racism in this league, and there are very real racists in positions of power in this league. 
So they're trying to operate a very delicate dance right now because at the same time, they can't just let their racist freak flag fly and just be like, <laughs> yeah, this is a racist operation because the league is 70% black. So you need, and that's why I think people like Colin Kaepernick and Michael Bennett, uh, th their greatest sin in the eyes of, of NFL power is that they stepped outside this highly autocratic, very top-down uh, structure, and they sit, they basically lived the words of Muhammad Ali, who said, I don't have to be who you want me to be. Uh, once you have black athletes saying that, it kind of upsets the whole apple cart of the structure of the league, which is, let's try to appease the players, while at the same time closing the door on real power. Michael, you've spoken about before about a fear of serious injury. Uh, you know, brain damage due to repeated knocks on the head. Uh, in your book, in fact, you said, I'm scared every time I go out on the field that something possibly could go wrong and I might leave my kids for good. How are leagues like the NFL structured to deal with serious player injuries? You know what? That's so interesting because uh, when me and Dave was working on the book, um, there were some moments in the book where it was like this uh, vulnerability and... Um, Honesty that it grabs you for a moment and it hits you with your own reality. And, mm. and like, that's a moment. There's a moment. That was a moment where I, I had to stop and it's like, Dave, I need a moment because tears started to come down my eyes because it's emotional because that's like looking, you looking at, you look at Junior Seas, you look at all these different people who have experienced a brain trauma or experienced some type of pain like that. And you, and you wonder sometimes, am I looking at, and when I look in the mirror or I'm looking at a broken man. And I think that's that's very scary when you start to think about when you could be harmed or you could be injured. But you know there's like a deal with the devil. Can the NFL do something more to make sure that the players are protected? Because you're right. I mean, if, if, if it's a sport that's a gladiator sport and you're running into each other, there's a level of violence that's inevitable in the sport. You can't play football and not get hurt, right? Um, but can no, the I think what the, I think what the NFL could do, I think personally what the NFL can do and where my idea would be would to be, be build, build treatment centers around America where athletes, all the, all the sporting leagues come together is where people can go and get treatment and find out what's going on with their bodies and spend a certain amount of time there when you retire. It's almost like you have to go in there and you have to spend a month, do psych training, go and bring your wife in there, bring your kids in there and just deal with injuries so you can have an opportunity to keep going to these places when you feel pain. Also giving, you know, healthcare and, and money for all these different things which they're doing. But I think there's just a deeper uh, thing that we have to deal with on the mental side that guys go through. And I think when you go through sports like this, you build up a sense of numbness and callousness to your body and your emotions that it's hard to even deal with things in life because you have been told to play to the pain. And you don't even know the relationship with pain, nor do you know the relationship with love or the relationship with your own emotions. Wow. David, Michael's talking about building structures in place to deal with the physical trauma, the mental anguish that comes with playing these sports. Um, but in the current moment, the NFL seems to be responding quite differently to player injuries. Uh, in 2019, two former black players filed a civil rights lawsuit against the NFL for what's called race norming, which assumes that black players have lower <laughs> cognitive function than white players. Talk to me about this practice. Uh, is it still happening, and why was it happening in the first place? Well, hopefully, due to public pressure, uh, this will not be happening going forward. I mean, a couple of things about it. First of all, as, as you well know, Mark, I mean, race norming, this idea of judging uh, black bodies and white bodies differently uh, is, is something that's been going on in this country since the transatlantic slave trade. I mean, this is something that this kind of racism in medicine runs very, very deep uh, in the American psyche. And it pushed forward into this concussion lawsuit that was negotiated by the NFL, by the NFL Players Association uh, together. You know, it, it was this idea that said that um, if you were a black player, then your cognitive ability, your baseline cognitive ability is inherently lower than your white teammates. Therefore, you don't need to be paid as much in the concussion lawsuit fallout because, for lack of a better way to put it, because you're cognitively impaired anyway. Right, you didn't lose as much Whether brain function because your brain didn't work that good anyway. Yes. Yeah, th that, that's the ugliness of this. 
And it was so ugly. The technician, we only know about this because of ABC News, because some technicians were whistleblowers. Uh, these technicians were emailing each other like, wow, this is really racist, what we're wow. doing right now. This is wrong. And then it came forward, and then the players came forward, and, and the NFL did what the NFL does very effectively. They were, you know, it, it's like the famous scene in Casablanca, like, we're shocked that there's gambling going on here. Here's your winnings, sir. You know, it's like we're, we're, we're going to be on the front lines ending race norming, not only in concussion settlement, not only are we going to change that, but in all of medicine, we're going to play a leadership role in making sure this never happens again. And, you know, immediately switching the narrative instead of saying, well, why was this practice seen as OK? And to me, very importantly, how does the fact that you exercise this practice, how does that connect with the fact that there are so few black people in positions of power and leadership in the National Football League? And, and, and that's a point that I want to get to, because, Michael, you played in the NFL. Uh, you're black. Seventy percent of your teammates were black. Uh, there are almost no black coaches in the NFL, head coaches in the NFL. Why? Actually, I don't know why. I think there's just, I think there's a, I think the black players have to say more. I think black players have to say more. I think black players have been very silent on, on this. And I think we as black players, even though the NFL is doing, it's the NFL's fault and they're doing this, but I think as black players, we can really take a, a stance and work and support uh, our fellow workers, and because a lot of the coaches used to be players, right? So it's like, well, well that's, that's what I don't get, right? That, that's what I'm saying. Because I'm, I'm with you, Michael. It's like there's a way that players can certainly do more to, to leverage their power to get the NFL to do the right thing. I just wanted to start at the place though that they're not doing the right thing. I mean, coaches they're are usually doing the right thing. Yeah. I'm agreeing with you that they're not doing the right thing. But I'm just saying, just like Colin Kaepernick was able to step up and change the narrative on what's happening outside of the NFL. How do we have that same narrative if gotcha. all 70 percent of all players said we're not playing till we start getting more black coaches in positions of power, till we get more black coaches in this, that's we can take the victimization of it and take the power and the control and say we're not playing. We love our black coach. He should have an opportunity. David, he, he, raises, a, he raises a good point about the NFL players responding to the kind of structural institutional racism that's reflected in, in, the, in the power dynamics, right, between who owns the teams uh, who coaches the teams, et cetera. But how do we get to this space where it's just accepted that all these black and brown people on the field are going to be led by white men on the sidelines? Uh, we've gotten to this place because the average career is only three and a half years and the contracts aren't guaranteed. And so everybody feels in a state of profound uncertainty all the time. And so this idea of speaking up, it comes with a cost. And then Colin Cap, the specter of someone like Colin Kaepernick haunts this new generation of players because it's like, hey, you want to speak out? You want to step out of line? Go right ahead. We can also take away your livelihood. And we have to remember this. And I was thinking about this when we were talking about class earlier. It's like players overwhelmingly come from working class or poor backgrounds. And this three and a half year career, that's the average length, that's when they're going to make over probably over 95 percent of the wealth that they're going to make over the course of their lives. And so the idea of keeping quiet and not risking a year of that due to a strike or a lockout or more of that becomes very important. So there's a lot of powerlessness in terms of being labor in the NFL, but there's also a lot of power because this is a multi-billion dollar operation and it only works if the players are willing to be on board. I think one of the most powerful NFL political moments of the last several years was after the police murder of George Floyd. The NFL issued a very tepid statement, and a group of players put out their own video saying the NFL is not doing enough to stand up at this critical moment in history. And the person who helped organize that and who led the charge was Patrick Mahomes. Now, why is that important? You're not going to get rid of a Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes could walk out naked onto Madison Avenue and, and do a little dance. And the NFL would say, oh, that just shows he has character. And I, I think in the NFL, when Patrick Mahomes did that, it sent at least a message to me that if the players wanted to, they could grab a piece of the string on the sweater that is the NFL and give it a mighty, mighty pull. We'll see what happens. But in the meantime, I'm, I'm excited that the energy on the ground is still there, that players are still resisting, that the analysis is still happening. And I'm glad that you two are, were able to join us today to weigh in on it. Michael Bennett, Dave Zirin, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront.
That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.